In brightest day, in darkest night, it's amalgam time, so hold on tight. Oh, Welcome it rhymed. to Dear Watchers, an omniversal comic book podcast where we do a deep dive into the multiverse. We are traveling with you through the stories and the worlds that make up an omniverse of fictional realities we all love. And your watchers on this journey are me, Guido. And me, the real star, Sapphire, of this podcast, <laughs> Rob. <laughs> and oh my gosh, it's it's a flashback. Because I think it's been almost a year since we've seen our dear friend, Ethan, make mine amalgam. Hi, Ethan. Yes, hello. Good to be back. <laughs> yeah, and you are fully decked out in your Iron Man and Green Lantern gear today. I love it. <laughs> On theme. Oh, oh, look at that. And even you got the toys out. Our listeners are are very excited to hear <laughs> about all of your things. I wish we could I wish we could be visual so that we could capture your energy. Cause you suggested this episode and we're gonna find out more about uh why and what you put together in just a moment. But before we begin today's trip, Guido, what's new in our little section of the multiverse? Uh, I don't think much. <laughs> <laughs> Comic Con is soon, and we keep saying that, but it finally is actually soon. So New York Comic Con's in October, but otherwise, I'm just gonna well, keep on keeping on. Well, once it gets closer on. to spooky season, which it now is, it that's is. when I associate Comic Con with. So when it's Halloween is coming, then Comic Con is coming. Yeah, we are right <laughs> in between summer and Halloween season, basically. But if you are joining us for the first time, we have three parts of our journey through the multiverse today. Origins of the story, exploring multiversity, and pondering possibility. So thanks for coming along. And please, as always, leave a five-star review wherever you're listening and find us on social media at Dear Watchers. And with that, Dear Watchers, welcome to episode 141. And let's check out what's happening in the Omniverse with our travels today's alternate universe. So we are polishing up our spiffiest armor to answer the question, what if Iron Man and Green Lantern amalgamated to become Iron Lantern? Ooh. <laughs> and of course, that's the question Ethan brings to us. Even though we've covered plenty of non-amalgams together, uh, we had to return to amalgam for your return to us. Absolutely. So quick Quick background, we have covered Amalgam before, starting with Spider-Boy in episode 36. We covered Doctor Strange Fate, episode 44, Speed Demon, 55, Dark Cloth, 73, Amazon in 130. So go find those episodes. We give a full history of Amalgam in that uh, Spider-Boy episode back in 36. So go Over listen there. Over 100 episodes ago. Over 100 episodes ago. Wow. <laughs> Gosh. And I don't Probably. even think we're halfway through. Amalgam? No, Amalgam? No, I know. We've barely scratched the surface, which is pretty wild. And this is well-timed because uh, Amalgam's about to get a boost, which we can talk about at the end. So this is also, in terms of the characters we are dealing with today, this is our first Green Lantern episode, and we've only covered Iron Man briefly back in episode 12 when he goes to King Arthur's time. <laughs> Ethan, meanwhile, thank you as always for joining us. This is your 11th episode with us. Ooh. Heck yeah. <laughs> that is so exciting. I think you probably maintain the record of most uh, guest appearances. I know you and Elliot were neck and neck for a while, but I think you've made a secure lead at this point. So nice. <laughs> I think you're safe and we love having you on. So thank you. If anyone thank wants you. to find those amalgam episodes or Ethan's guest appearances, if you go to dearwatchers.com and click episodes, you can search the whole catalog or just search wherever you're listening and you can find our amalgam episodes and Ethan's guest appearances. And before we get into our backgrounds with these characters, Ethan, why Iron Lantern? Why is he our question for today? <laughs> um, I think I just kind of had a hankering to revisit this particular one. There wasn't any like real itch that needed to be scratched that was specific <laughs> just that like oh you know what we haven't talked about iron lantern and i felt like uh talking about iron lantern yeah and he's a pretty key key amalgam and 
I have a feeling you would be happy with any amalgam that we covered. So, oh, totally. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have covered our own backgrounds with amalgam in the past, so we're not going to dive deep into that. But as you said, Guido, we have pretty much never covered Iron Man, just that one ex one -ish episode. And we have never covered Green Lantern, a pretty big character. So let's talk a little bit about our backgrounds with those characters. So Ethan, you're our special guest. So why don't you kick us off? What's your background with Green Lantern and Iron Man? Well, Green Lantern and Iron Man are both characters I know a little bit about both. Um, <laughs> in high school, I was, I was reading a lot of Green Lantern, but mostly because of, um, the Jeff Johns stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I always consider Blackest Night to be my event comic. Um, oh, cause that was the one, that was the one that was, uh, that was like big when I was really avidly collecting. Uh-huh. And so um, maybe that's kind of the connection I have with Green Lantern. But I haven't really read much of the old school stuff. Um, so that must have been another reason why I was looking forward to doing Iron Lantern. <laughs> um, but uh, I kind of knew about him through cartoons. Actually, I forgot to put this in my notes. My first exposure to Hal Jordan was the Daffy Duck Buck Rogers parody Duck Dodgers TV show. Oh, of That's course. That's my age. Like, <laughs> when I, I proudly say this, when I was a kid and I watched um, the Justice League cartoon, Jon Stewart was my first Green Lantern. And yeah. I remember as a kid just accepting, oh, cool, Green Lantern's a black dude. And then, <laughs> I, and then I saw that there was a whole core, and I was like, oh, cool, there's a whole bunch of them. But yeah, yeah, John was my first, my first Green Lantern. Um, and then with I Iron Man, I think I've read more appearances of the character than actual mm -hmm. issues of his series per se. Um, but that said, uh, this read, this read through has actually made me want to uh, check out more of both. Ooh, hmm. I can't yeah. wait to hear why. <laughs> Exciting. <laughs> How about you, Guido? I know these are like top tier characters for you. No. Wait, <laughs> no, they're not top being... tier characters oh, for well, you. Well, you said they were. Oh, no, I said not. <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> no, not at all. Well, like you, Ethan, it, Green Lantern, I have almost no exposure or interest in. I read Zero Hour and could not understand Parallax and as it was coming out because mm -hmm. I didn't care about Hal Jordan at all or Green mm -hmm. Lantern. And the cosmic stuff didn't interest me, but I love Jeff Johns. So I did read Rebirth and some of the Rebirth era, but then I fell off because the characters just don't do it for me. Right. Uh, and the, the whole like cosmology of the Green Lanterns doesn't really do it for me. The Hal Jordan Green Lanterns, the Alan Scott Green Lantern, I really like and that's oh, me a different too. thing. So that's him. I'm so I'm not a fan and don't know a lot. I, I don't hate the character. I just yeah. am not a fan. I saw the He's, movie. He's a blind, <laughs> a blind spot. Yeah, he is a blind spot. Iron Man is somewhat the same, but just because I was such a Marvel reader for most of my life, I know a lot more about Iron Man. I've having read every event and every iteration of Avengers and West Coast Avengers like I know a lot about Iron Man I read some of the 98 Kurt Busiek reboot of Iron Man post Heroes Reborn uh, but otherwise I also haven't read a lot of the classic Iron Mans and I have fun when I do but I never am like oh I'm gonna sit down and do a giant read through so I know yeah. a lot about Iron Man but I'm not a fan and <laughs> so that's my deal with Hal and Tony. Hal and Tony also, it feels like they should open a pizza place together. By yes. Way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Hal and Tony's. <laughs> Rob, what about you? Well, with Green Lantern, I maybe read one Hal Jordan comic ever. <laughs> like you mentioned, Zero Hour Guido, and that, Ethan, was my event that I read. I love Zero Hour, but him being parallax at the end it really didn't really mean that much to me the green lantern i read the most of was alan scott because growing up i did love the jsa and the all-star squadron so i could never really understand especially in pre-internet times why were there two 
Green Lanterns. They're dressed totally different. Their powers are a little different. So that was a little beyond me there. And for Iron Man, he would pop up in various books, like a Spider-Man. He'd make like a little appearance or something like that. But I think like both of you, I never really read an Iron Man book. Where I really knew Iron Man from was the animated TV show in the 90s with the Mandarin and the Grey Gargoyle. And I used to love that show. I have not revisited it in a very long time. So I do not know if it would hold up at all. But that was definitely my Iron Man. So, yeah, we're all about the same. We know these characters exist, but we don't know a lot about them. So mm -hmm. let's see what and happens when we dig in. Something that uh, came to mind when I was reading this, and again, this is not why I chose it, but it's just a weird coincidence. The Iron Man movie came out in 2008. The Green Lantern movie came out in 2011. Just kind of weird that they came out around the same time. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 They're, yeah. they're both like early in the modern heyday of comic book movies and i've never only seen... one was really successful yes, and one was true. Not. <laughs> and i've never seen the green the green lantern movie yeah, i'm have, sure a lot of but... people have not <laughs> but i do think what you know what i do see is that there's an alien spaceship that's crash landed in the distance so why don't we go and investigate with our origins of the story Right now, on this very show, you're going to get the answer to all your questions. Our amazing story begins a few years ago. So first, let's talk about the origins of our two main characters here, Tony and Hal, owners of the best pizza place in Brooklyn. <laughs> and first up is showcase number 22 from DC Comics. This is entitled SOS Green Lantern from October 1959. So this is the first appearance of Hal Jordan as Green Lantern, which is the reborn, rebooted Green Lantern with this cosmic origin. It's written by John Broom, penciled by Gil Kane, inked by Joe Giella, lettered by Gaspar Saladino, and edited by Julie Schwartz. And next up is Tales of Suspense, number 39, from Marvel, entitled Iron Man is Born, from March 1963. This is the first appearance of Tony Stark and Iron Man, written by Stan Lee and Larry Lieber, penciled by Don Heck, who also does the inks, colored by Stan Goldberg, lettered by Artie Simek, and edited by Stan Lee. So, origins of our guys today. <laughs> well, both of these... I don't know if I've read these exact issues before, mm -hmm. but I've definitely read variations on there. Yeah, totally. Yeah. They're, th it's amazing for, for non-top tier characters, at least to the three of us, and I'd say to most people, both of these origins are so uh, known by comic fans. I'm sure people outside of comics don't know the origins so well of these two, <laughs> other than the MCU movies, of course. Mm -hmm. But... But just everything with Ab and Sir giving Hal the lantern, I agree with you, Ethan. Like, I was reading it and was like, I don't know if I've read this issue, and yet I know this so yeah. well. Well, mm -hmm. it's also been in cartoons. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess it's been redone so many times that we have been exposed to the ideas. Also, side note about, um, about the uh, Green Lantern Oath. I was simultaneously able to skim it and read the whole thing at the same time because I may not be able to remember why I walked into the kitchen, but gosh darn it, I can recite the Green Lantern Oath. Like <laughs> <laughs> well, it is so well constructed with the rhyming pattern and stuff. Uh, I, I think, yeah, I agree with you. I feel like I can recite that also, even though I probably would have forgotten, you know, Carol Carol's last name or something mm -hmm. like Paris. I don't know a lot about this <laughs> mm -hmm. well and like so many comics of its era it just says okay Hal you are going to be the new Green Lantern because you were a good person and that's it like today I think or if this was a movie I'm sure this happens in the movie we would see a whole scene as to like oh, here is Hal Jordan and he's saving a puppy and, and he's a nice person and we get to know him. Here it's just like, no, I have spoken. I know that you, that the ring has told me you are good. It just like cuts right to the chase. 
<laughs> well, because both of these, what's interesting about them, too, is they're both stories in a larger anthology book. So they're mm -hmm. both actually quite short. And that means they also both do rely on a lot of narration. What I, I was surprised that the opening page in both of these issues, and they're four years apart, so I guess they're the same era, but of course, 63, you're moving into the Silver Age. Both of them on the opening splash page have like a little description of who the character is before you even read the origin. Mm -hmm. It gives you like a two sentence summary of what you're about to read. So they're sort of old school in that way. Mm -hmm. But they were fine. Yeah. yeah. Well, it struck me, too, that both of them there are echoes of other comic book characters in both of these, especially here with Hal and the love interest storyline where she is in love with Hal, but she's also in love with the Green Lantern. So it's very much the Superman, Clark, Lois mm -hmm. love triangle mm -hmm. just now moved into these new characters. And she's like kind of Lois. She's also given a lot of, onus as a character because she is like a, a boss other woman, than which is interesting. Uh, other boss. than the fact that you need well this actually doesn't come up until the next issue but that there's an editor's asterisk explaining why she's in charge of the company <laughs> like they say she's in charge of the company and then there's a little asterisk and the editor is like because her dad is with her mom on like a global tour she is a nepo <laughs> baby yes yes she does. <laughs> so yeah i think they're fun i think also uh, what's cool about iron lantern and amalgam in this is there are similarities i think had you asked me for a character who's like tony stark in the dc universe i think most of us are probably inclined to say more like someone like bruce wayne yeah but hal is a good analog for him and reading these two issues together they're they're pretty similar mm -hmm. uh, i think ultimately Tony gets a lot more depth and a lot more demons and stuff like that. But in these first issues, they're both these sort of hot shots for different reasons. They're both sciency. Mm -hmm. They're both good guys. Uh, so yeah, I think it's an, it's a cool pairing that mm -hmm. we got to read here. Mm -hmm. And exactly. there's, there's, there's certainly though a lot in the Iron Man book that has not aged well so oh they're, they're both racist yeah, for 100 they're both, 100%. Them, but they're both yeah, racist. The iron man one especially <laughs> but yeah Green lantern that's pretty bad too yeah yeah mm -hmm. they are both racist let's be clear <laughs> yes, yes, yes they are yeah but there's also so much with the iron man character that i was surprised here because i didn't know from reading this that of course, we're kind of familiar from the movie that he has to have the armor to really save himself and keep the heart going. But when this issue ends, it's kind of set up that he can't take the armor off and that he's <laughs> always going to be stuck in this armor. And it has these allusions to like the Fantastic Four, especially the Thing, in that he's almost like this monster. He'll be an outcast from an outcast, society. And the Hulk yeah. as well. So there's that kind of Marvel thing of he's a hero, but he's also an outcast. Yeah. Whereas DC's thing is the dual identity. Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> Always exactly. the dual yeah. identity. Yeah. Yeah. So we see those core tropes in there. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, Iron Man has a dual identity. He puts on a hat and then suddenly you don't know that he's a, like a giant robot. Made man. of armor. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's talk about our villains here through amalgamation of some of our leading ladies, both appeared pretty early on in the runs of our main characters. So we have Green Lantern number 16, that's the second volume, from DC Comics from October 1962, and that's entitled The Secret Life of Star Sapphire. <laughs> this is the first appearance of the already established Carol Ferris as Star Sapphire. It's written by John Broom again, penciled by Gil Kane, inked by Joe Giella, lettered by Gaspar Saladino, edited by Julie Schwartz. Then we have Iron Man number 17 and 18 from Marvel. This is from September and October 1969, entitled The Beginning of the End and Even Heroes. Die. This is the first appearance of the very briefly already established Whitney Frost as Madam Mask, and it's written by Archie Goodwin, penciled by George Tuska, inked by Johnny Craig, lettered by Gene Izzo, and edited by Stan Lee. So, Ethan, these were new to you, I'm assuming, also? Um, pretty much. Um, again, I may have known Carol Ferris 
but possibly I knew it because I knew the character. I don't mm-hmm. know if I've read that issue, but that must have been, that's probably my favorite issue that I read aside from the actual amalgam. Really? I the, Why? I love, the, I love the Zamorans. I just think yeah. they're neat. I think they're <laughs> like, um, I think they're just like uh, Silver Age warrior women that uh-huh. are basically space Amazons. I thought that mm-hmm. was super cool. Um, I love the idea that their queen has to be immortal, and Carol just happened to look exactly like their queen. <laughs> well, and every um, version of her has to look identical. Like, so that means there's been many other versions that look exactly like it's that. It's a little it's like, so like, weird. Exactly like like the Maybe. Dalai Lama kind of, right? She just like reincorporates somewhere else in throughout the universe. Yeah, they're not identical though. <laughs> no, no. Well, no true. Maybe it's Carol's mother and then her grandmother and her great grandmother. Oh true. That's true, true. true. Yeah. yeah. I also really love the trope. Um, and I think we talked about this where it was like the love triangle. However mm-hmm. however, I like the additional layer yeah. where Okay, well, she has a dual identity too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like a love quadrangle now. Basically. <laughs> yeah, well, like except she doesn't remember square. that she's Star Sapphire at the end of this mm-hmm. issue, so that's exactly. like an interesting right. dynamic. Mm-hmm. And I and am, then, I, I, go ahead, Ethan. <laughs> yeah, her costume. I think that's an ideal costume. That's yes, exactly. yeah, it is great. Perfect costume. Don't fix what ain't broken. I know exactly <laughs> why they changed it later on, but growing up means knowing that this is the best costume. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I have the, it's actually Blackest Night era, I think. I have a, a figure you would appreciate if you don't already have it, which is the Wonder Woman Star Sapphire. I don't have it, but when I know she of it. becomes the Star Sapphire at Blackest Night, yes. they did a figure of it, so I Which have that and love it. Funny because I, I don't know Blackest. Black. Oh, cool! And I don't know Blackest Night, but it, it there's so much relationship between Wonder Woman and Star Sapphire as like these Amazons and the and then the human man who's also like a. a fighter pilot like oh, there's just a yes. lot of natural connection there <laughs> yeah well and especially like i i always appreciate when you have them like they just hate men they're like <laughs> no like, and they're immortal there are no men they're yeah. so angry at carol that she's like wants to stay on earth for the, her love of this man mm-hmm. and that's why they're putting her through these tests or making her test green lantern and so it is it is a funny clearly influenced by wonder woman thing that's happening but it's different enough that i uh, enjoy it Mm -hmm. also yeah now now that book is fairly straightforward especially compared to the iron man oh my gosh that are (laughs) totally like batman 66 wacky no but i think they're even they're just i'd say they're more serious than that because there is so much happening in those two issues i can't believe i see why people fell in love with iron man because the depth of storytelling at this point i mean you already here have like his brother and you have the life model decoy and you have Maddie, Madam mask who was Whitney Frost who had gotten in a plane crash and Tony Stark had saved, but then her face is all distorted. Now she's working for Midas. And it's like, there's so much going on off the panel that like you need to know or, or assume you know to read this. And it's only issue 17. (laughs) <laughs> yeah exactly exactly yeah. yeah well as a as a soap opera fan you know i was really f- feeling like you must have been associating it with the soap opera element because there's even those two other characters so i don't even know who they are he's like another scientist and she's like another industrialist and they're just like also and they're just having a romance having a and romance. you don't know yeah, why <laughs> separate from the main story i as agree well. i didn't know what was going on <laughs> i had no idea who they were so there was a lot happening in the book mm-hmm and I love Midas, who maybe I knew in passing, but he's kind of like Maxi Zeus uh-huh. meets I, I Victor Bono's that. King Tut from the Batman series. And 
he's just very pompous and exaggerated and flamboyant and he's like too lazy to get out of his chair he's just constantly eating a turkey leg and blasting people with lasers so <laughs> yeah, great a great villain and then he is balanced so well with madame mask because if you have a villain like that then you want the kind of kick-ass woman in all black with like the mask and that she's just like she has such a good people. design yeah yeah mm-hmm. <laughs> I really she looks like a Bond design. character. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I awesome. bet that was an influence at the and time. He must have been influenced by Goldfinger, right? So, oh maybe yeah, she's probably. It being like sixty nine, the Bond villain yeah. there. You know, she other. I don't know if you know this, Ethan, but she reminds me of Pythona from the GI Joe movie. Do you know the GI Joe movie? Um, and she's just not necessarily her design, but just again, I guess like that. She's like the second well there's so many characters like that i feel like in star captain in the world of tomorrow and it's always like the woman in all leather or even in golden eye like thinking about bond villains too <laughs> yeah. i can see that <laughs> mm-hmm. so yeah she was fun to read i and i, I was thinking about how much i loved agent carter because she's mm. a character in agent carter uh-huh. i don't know if oh. you watched that tv Jeez. show ethan no i have and not. it's yeah it made me miss that show uh because, yeah, it's a good good depiction of her. She's a fun fun character. I don't know. In both of these cases, what I'd say these reads did is made me want to go read a little more of those characters. Like, I would yeah. go read more Star Sapphire because I want to know, does Carol, when does Carol, I, I would imagine she ultimately remembers she's Star Sapphire at some point in the last uh 60 years of comics <laughs> oh, yeah. so i want to like hear that story and with madame mask she's she's working for midas here i want to see when she's working for herself i want that story <laughs> which i'm sure exists also in the last 60 years of comics so yeah <laughs> sisters are doing it for themselves <laughs> <laughs> well let us Watch out when these universes collide. It's time to amalgamate with exploring multiversity. I am your guide through these vast new realities. Follow me and ponder the question. What if? And today's issue is... Iron Lantern number one from June 1997. There is no cover date, so this no, is... No, June 1997 June, is the cover oh, date. Oh, is the cover date, so this is wave my two notes, Rob is reading. <laughs> of, of Amalgam. And from Amalgam Comics, which is Marvel and DC together, of course. And this issue is entitled Showdown at Stark Aircraft. So it is written by Kurt Busiek, penciled by Paul Smith. More on them in a moment. It is inked by the largest team of inkers I think have ever worked on a book I've ever read. Mm -hmm. Because it's Al Williamson, Andrew Papoy, Greg Adams, Bob McLeod, Tom Palmer, Al Milgram, and Paul Smith. Well, and Al Williamson is given the top credit. Everyone else was like assisting him, apparently. No idea what is going on here. (laughs) Clearly rushed to get out. <laughs> Colored by Christy Scheel and Digital Chameleon. Lettered by Richard Starkings and Comic Craft. And edited by Tom Brevort. So real quick on the creators before Rob reminds us of what happens with a summary. Kurt is already a legend at this point. We know this. We've discussed him many times. But relative to these characters, he actually did two Green Lantern backups in the 1980s before he was really solidified at Marvel and would co-plot Iron Man, but not until 98 and that reboot. So he hadn't yet worked on Mm. Iron Man at this point that he's writing this amalgam. And Paul Smith is just amazing. I don't think we've gotten to talk about him here, but he's best known by X-Men fans, I think. He created the Mohawk Storm and did a bunch of the early 80s Claremont era classics and has just this really sleek, like Duran Duran style, very 80s, 90s. And he did do one or two Iron Man books prior to this, but also hadn't worked on these characters extensively. And so, Rob, why don't you remind us what happened in this issue? (laughs) So Iron Man is Hal Stark. Iron Lantern. Uh, Iron Lantern is Hal Stark, a hot shot pilot and industrialist who is summoned to a dying alien. But an accident occurs and Stark almost dies saving himself by creating an armor out of the dead alien's tech. 
Our story starts with Hal bringing Hector, a Hector Hammond Modoc amalgam, to be imprisoned inside Oa, the living planet. <laughs> Meanwhile, Hal, his friends Stuart Rhodes, and Harold Kalmaku attend a fancy party, but when Senator Ferris berates his own daughter Pepper Ferris over a failed flight test, Pepper storms off and encounters a strange rock that once again turns her into Madame Sapphire. This purple menace summons the giant robot Great White to disrupt the party and tangle with Iron Lantern. The emerald shell head defeats the giant shark, but just then his power source is zapped thanks to a double-crossing Kyle O'Brien who substituted for Hal as the Green Guardian and is on a quest for more power. He steals Hal's power source and as Pal Hal plummets back to Earth, it is revealed that all of the actions are at the hands of the behind-the-scenes villain whose name rolls off the tongue Mandarinestro. <laughs> <laughs> all right thank you for that so and in case anyone needs a list of various characters here they are Hal yeah. Stark, we established as tody stark and hal jordan pepper ferris is pepper potts and carol ferris who becomes madam sapphire who is a mix of madam mask and star <laughs> sapphire yeah so she's happy, a triple happy kalmuk kalmaku is happy hogan and Thomas Kalmaku. Thomas Mal Kalmaku is the mechanic friend. Right. Who's, mm -hmm. who's the, the racist stereotype who, in the who earlier is issues. Who's referred to as Thomas. Yes. yes. <laughs> we will not call him by whatever the hell that other name was. Yes. <laughs> um, which, interesting, they say, um, con uh, confidant, because they also mentioned in the, um, in the Star Sapphire issue that uh flash is a confidant mm -hmm. to um hal jordan and did you say uh al milgram inked this uh this book uh he was one of the people who helped al williamson out yes well al milgram also was part of the speed demon book so uh. i just find that another interesting coincidence so now it's my head canon that speed demon and uh and Iron Lantern are tight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that'd be a good team-up book. Mm -hmm. oh, that'd be an incredible team-up book. Uh, Stuart Rhodes is James Rhodey Rhodes and uh, John Stewart. So he's War mm -hmm. Machine and John Stewart. Green Guardsman is weird. So he's a guy named Michael O'Brien who became one of the Guardsman characters. And then some sources say he's Guy Gardner. Hmm. but they call him Kyle, so I... Right, so he's Kyle Rayner. I yeah. thought he was Kyle Rayner, but it must have been the red hair that made him Guy. Well, and the fact that he's a bit of a jerk, because I, I was thinking Guy while I was reading it, too. But I think there's also a Guy Gardner who's working for the Senator, too, along with the Henry Peter Gyrick amalgam. Ah. So, I mean, mm -hmm. we know from amalgam, and Ethan certainly can tell us this like there is another uh tony stark amalgam in the amalgam universe mm -hmm. like this is not the only one yeah so they often will use characters twice whether they're that just dip. because they were not edited super well or just because <laughs> oh, they didn't no. care about the rules <laughs> or whatever who knows and then we also have human lantern who was named oh Rose. yeah and he's yes. alan scott and jim ha hammond the android right, right. human torch and yeah. we actually don't see him in this issue, but we do see him in the Super Soldier Man of War issue where we meet a bunch of like JSA. Right. From the past. That's fun. Yeah. Hector is Hector. Hammond okay. And Modoc. This is the yeah. best one. <laughs> yeah. This one makes so much sense. Like yes. this one, as soon as they thought of it, their, their heads must have. Exploded. Yeah. But what's even better is <laughs> the acronym because. Uh -huh. All I could think was how much fun it must have been to try to come up with an acronym that works just as well as MODOK, which is, of course, a ridiculous acronym. So now we have Hector, the highly evolved creature, totally oriented on revenge. <laughs> it's so awesome. I love that part. And I just love that they put the two big headed guys together. Uh -huh. Like it was too obvious. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's not Who else do we have? have? Oa, no, I know. <laughs> Oa, the living planet. And that is a planet. So Oa 
the living... So Oa is a planet who's also a part of the Green Lantern Corps. Mm-hmm. And then he's mixed with Ego the Living Planet. And whose face is that? Is that what Oa looks like? Because it almost looks to me like they're drawing like... I don't like some, blue face? Like W.C. Fields or something. Like they're drawing <laughs> some like 1930s man. Um, I thought that was supposed to be a guardian. Okay. Yeah, doesn't he look? That's what the guardians look like. They're I guess. All, like little because he doesn't look like ego. Or, yeah. yeah. So, but it's yeah, just I the detail that, there is so weird. Yeah. I took that to be just another take on Uatu the guardian. Mm-hmm, that right. Surprise yeah. was not explicitly in here because he yeah. is mixed with I would assume Gantlet. Right. Mm-hmm. That's true. Um, Mandarin Astro is <laughs> Sinestro. <laughs> And then Great Which White, is a lazy amalgam name. Yeah. Great White I had to look up. Yeah, this me is too. an Iron Man villain named Ultimo and the Green Lantern villain Shark. The latter okay. is a shark that gets mutated and becomes partly humanoid. Amazing. Like, and he, well, he actually, like... he has an official action figure, but the heckler doesn't. <laughs> well, I kept thinking like it's Killer Shark, but it was like, wait, I don't think Killer Shark has any inter- interactions with any of these characters. Yeah, no. Yeah, no. I had actually thought that King Shark was one of them, mm-hmm. but then I had to remind myself that King Shark and Lizard are mixed. But right, then I also right. had to remind myself that it doesn't matter. <laughs> right. <laughs> then he might have still been double dipped. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? Or that's everybody, right? I believe that's everybody. I think oh, that's everybody. No, actually, I missed one. Um, oh. Kamaku is mixed with Happy Hogan. Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 So, a lot of characters, a lot going on. Who wants, who, who's got a take? <laughs> well, I was just going to say, I remember this issue so well. It's funny, we just recently covered on the podcast global jeopardy wolverine global jeopardy and that was another issue like this one where instantly as soon as i read it it just came back to me so it was just this was one of the amalgams i just read over and over and i think and maybe maybe this was the same thing with you ethan like i knew iron lantern almost better than i knew green lantern and iron man other than knowing the lore of those characters but i actually Thanks. probably read this more than i read either of their individual books yeah. And Ethan, where does Iron Lantern rank for you? Is it in the top tier, top third of your amalgams, mid third or lower third probably, of your amalgams? Probably high mid. Okay. Because like he's not he's definitely not Spider Boy by any means. Mm-hmm. Like that's my all time fave. But yeah, I do think he's got a really neat costume. I love that he's got the green instead of the yellow i always joke anytime i see a green um iron man suit i'm like oh it's iron lantern and sometimes <laughs> maybe somebody snuck it in other <laughs> times i'm just looking for it um honestly it's a hell of a lot better than uh, rdj as uh dr doom <laughs> but the less said about that the better maybe he's gonna be iron lantern <laughs> <laughs> who knows he's hal stark also well i think the thing too uh, for me is that some of the times the amalgams while they're fun they don't always like make a logical sense but with this one i think it just makes a lot of sense like oh, yeah. oh he gets this alien tech that powers this armor to keep him alive it just makes it just works for me like oh instead of a ring which actually is kind of like sillier it's like oh no he creates this out of like a battery that can never die that just to me makes sense i also really love the call and response that Mm -hmm. they use Mm -hmm. for the um oath yeah where he says in brightest day and then it responds with in blackest night yeah, As and this is how voice. he unlocks the armor yeah. mm-hmm. with the computer. It's Yeah, I think that's a very cool inclusion. Yeah, I think there are some subtle things in here, and it's no surprise coming from Kurt Busiek, who, who knows Marvel and DC characters probably better than almost anyone alive. And so the fact that he can do little things like that, or the origin retelling too, I think, not just as great, because of what you're saying, Rob, that it works together, but just 
the visuals, like they both are origins that take place in the desert mm -hmm. and with crashed planes. And so like just that visual retelling is like, oh my gosh, these two totally work. If you loved both these characters and having just read the origin issues, like this is a perfect fusion of them. Mm -hmm. It is an amalgam, truly. And and Pe Pepper and Carol too, just as a as an amalgam characters as these tough you know, boss women and who are also fighters as well. It just, just works as well for them being these these on again off again love interests. Although Kurt makes Tony her boss, Hal, sorry, Hal Stark, her <laughs> boss in this, mm. and I was a little annoyed by that because you had so much opportunity for Carol is the boss. And Pepper eventually becomes the boss. At this point, she might not yet be the boss in comic continuity. But there's that line where he's like, I can't, I can't be with her. I'm her boss. And it's like, no, no, no. She's your boss. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> but other than that, that's my, that's my one gripe. Uh, in terms of the villain, I guess, that, I guess I'll add a gripe. The villain, I think it's just too, there's too much going on with the villain. Yes. Maybe it's because I don't know these characters super well, but the fact that it's, Pepper and Carol as Star Sapphire and Madame Mask. It's like that's a whole lot being smushed together. I think the Madame Mask is probably only put in there for like the visual element. Yeah. I don't see a lot mm -hmm. plot wise that makes it important that it's Madame Mask. Mm -hmm. Though visually, I think she looks great. I mean, yeah, it's almost, a cool look. There's almost a mystique quality to her too with the red hair and the purple skin. Yeah. She actually kind of looks like the Ghost Rider villain Lilith. Oh yes, yes, she does I agree look a lot with the like the, the with shape the, of the mm -hmm. face and the white yeah. skin. Yes, yeah, yeah. And in fact, I think throughout this book, one of the highlights is the coloring for me. Mm -hmm. He he, it was because very similar again to like the Global Jeopardy coloring, where everything is super bright. There's nothing that is dull tones, and I think that's constant throughout a lot or common in a lot of the amalgam books that we've covered. But here, I think it's definitely amped up, especially just that color green and yellow that they choose for Iron Lantern suit. It just really pops right off the page. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It looks great. So anything else to say on Iron Lantern? I say that I like the villains, but I wish that the main one, well, actually the main one still is uh, Carol, Madam Sapphire. I almost called her Madam Hydra. Uh, <laughs> but um, She has that look too. Yeah, but I think it would be cooler if they just did the that character and not all the I other agree. ones. And if yeah. they just focused on her, it would have been a stronger story. Yeah, I agree with that. I think some of that is, and this is this is the double edged sword of of so, a writer like Kurt Busiak who knows so much. It's like Mark Gruenwald's writing too. Like what he's trying to do, I think is play with all these elements because he keeps referring to like oh we've met her before mm -hmm. so like he's really stepping into the like fake world aspect of this and so i think that's why she's not the central villain because the idea is like we already know her and this is her big return and she's gonna right. employ this other guy but i totally agree with you that i would have enjoyed it a lot more if if it had focused on her as the villain instead of the distraction with the the mega shark out in outer space <laughs> and also the the green oh. guardsman yes he, he yes kind of yes weaker all that opinion. totally <laughs> And interestingly, before we move on to our final segment, I so usually we include information about the that comes out of the trading card set because the trading cards have so much great backstory and somehow Iron Lantern is completely missing from the set. I'm going to assume there's was a deadline thing or something because it's so, so unusual. But what's weird is I think there are some second wave amalgam characters in the trading card set, but he's missing completely, not even a reference. So we have no additional information from that <laughs> to go on. It's a shame. Like, Mandarin Estro should totally have his own card. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Exactly. Like, I want to know more about Mandarin Estro. <laughs> or Hector. I, I Please, Hector. Also, so. also maybe he... 
No, actually, he absolutely had a yellow ring at this point. So I don't know why Mandarin Astro didn't have yellow rings. Oh, yeah. Right. Or multicolored rings. Multicolored like, rings. he could have had different... I don't know how much of the emotional spectrum existed in comics at this point, uh, but that was still... A Jones. That was a Jeff oh, Jones. Oh, it was. Thing. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, he could have had yellow, for sure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, like, yeah. yellow would have made the most sense. But I guess they just wanted to recreate the crazy how Jordan killed all the lanterns oh um image again yeah uh, yeah hmm. yeah all right so shall well, we yeah much as we don't know what happens next with iron lantern we don't know what's happening in our third segment so let's ponder some possibilities will the future you describe be averted 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 because usually for this segment, I say, Guido, what are we talking about for our <laughs> pondering possibilities? But Guido, I don't think you know either. No, I do have a few things to say in this segment, but Ethan's going to take it away and lead us as we ponder. <laughs> well, Kurt Busiek did not publish another comic book, but he plotted out Iron Lantern 2. Get out. So I had no idea to this link that I again wanted to surprise you with. I'm <laughs> so glad had, you are. Somebody had found some like emails of what Iron Lantern 2 was going to be about. So it starts off with whoever's writing to Kurt says, I wish they hadn't ended this one on a cliffhanger. I really want to know what happens next. <laughs> and then Kurt says, okay, Here's what happens next. Spoiler. <laughs> Pepper Ferris does not know that Hal is really Iron Lantern, but Madame Sapphire does. And when she realizes just what that shooting star is, her submerged love for Hal spurs her to save him. She powers up his armor with Sapphire energy, and the two of them go looking for the lantern. They catch up to Kyle just as he's realized that Mandarin Estro is about to kill him and save both his life and the battery. Kyle becomes the Green Guardsman and the three of them open up a can of whoop-ass on Mandarin Estro, <laughs> which, for all their power, would go badly for them if not for the timely arrival of Tagak Lantern Lord. Mandarin Estro escapes, but Tagak has some revelations for Hal about Oa the Living Planet, and Janus Doremus is back at Stark Aircraft, and she's got secrets of her own, secrets that involve the deadly Lamplight Phantom. And then they, they go through, like, back and forth, who's who, and they reply, okay, Tagak the Leopard Lord, last appearance, I believe, in the you're a defender, he's a defender, wouldn't you like to be a defender too story way back when, and a Green Lantern amalgam. The Living wow. Planet and Janus Doremus is back at Stark Aircraft, and Janus Cord, head of Cord Co., and a love interest of Tony Stark and Crimson Dynamo Mark III, or so amalgamated with Eve Doremus, Hal's love interest after Carol Ferris and another heiress. Mm -hmm. A bit odd for this amalgam to be a secretary, but perhaps that's part of her dark secrets. And then they wanted to know um, who's Lamplight Phantom. Yeah. And, and it's a villain named Lamplighter from Green Lantern. Oh, uh -huh. And a character named Night Phantom, who is an obscure huh. three-issue yeah. Iron Man foe. Oh, wow. That is wild. Yeah. And that's the extent of that. <laughs> wow. That is so cool that that is out there. And it makes me think that I bet everyone writing Amalgam issues had more stories in mm -hmm. mind, even though they knew it was never going to be told I think it's probably impossible as a storyteller to not be thinking a little bit more about the world you're building out. And so it's so cool that someone had this exchange with Kurt where he was willing to share like mm -hmm. what he was thinking, even though I'm sure 
there was probably never a real intention to have a second issue of it. It was more like he was sketching it out in his mind. Yeah. And that is very neat. Do yeah. you, you want to see that issue published? I absolutely do. I would also <laughs> really like to see whatever they can come up with with uh, Black Hand from um, Blackest Night. Yeah. Well, technically mm. not even Blackest Night, because I believe he was a Silver Age villain that was repurposed by Johns and made way more menacing. But yeah, it makes me wonder what, what weird necromancing character uh-huh. could be mixed with um, Necron and or um, Blackhand. Hmm. And then, of yeah. course, I want to see more Mandarin Estro. <laughs> yes. yeah well and even in the book they do mention the secretary coming back and that she's got secrets it's in the final in the fake letters, the fake page. letters yes. page it mentions yeah. that so even that is speaking to the uh, what you were saying Guido, is that they were thinking about this well they wrote the fake next issues so mm-hmm. they had to think a little bit at a least little bit ahead. because of that yeah yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. That's so fun. I love that that is there. It makes me want, as I've said on many of our amalgam discussions, like I really either want someone or I want to someone to pay me to take a year off and do this is write an oral history of amalgam comics. Mm -hmm. And I and and include all of these. What what other ideas were out there? I bet there's even I bet there's core amalgam titles that they didn't use that someone mm. thought of and developed. I mean, there's no way that they came up with 27 amalgam titles and didn't come up with more than 27 and cut some. Mm-hmm. So it's so it's so interesting. And so many of the creators are still with us. So yeah, gotta, gotta tap into that resource. <laughs> it's my goal. It is my goal to have at least one signature per amalgam book. Oh, how fun. Because, I can't get I can't get like Mike Waringo signature for Spider Boy. I got Carl Ke- Carl Kessel though. Mm-hmm. Um, I I already did get what um, Keith Giffen for Thorian. Thankfully, uh, may he rest in peace. Um, but let's just say one of those um, Magneto and the Magnetic Men not going to do the writing. <laughs> no, not gonna do the right <laughs> that's a fun goal though and mm-hmm. and as you meet people you can say hey i have this friend who wants to write an oral history of amalgam mm-hmm. so absolutely <laughs> <laughs> um because the cool thing of course the timing i mentioned earlier in the episode of us covering this is that for the first time in 25 years amalgam is being reprinted as an omnibus and i am it is dying for this book it's gonna be so good and it keeps getting delayed it's been delayed i think three times now it's now for october although i really am worried it's just either never gonna come out or it's Mm -hmm. gonna get delayed even more but they say it's coming out in october and i can't wait it's so cool and i really wonder if it's gonna do anything Mm -hmm. Well, not just the amalgam book. We're getting an amalgam book and we're getting a crossover book. Yeah. And when there's so many good classic ones that haven't yeah. been reprinted either. So many classic ones that, again, I'm the crossover guy. I haven't even read. Because, <laughs> because they're not legally streaming anywhere. I can't mm-hmm. just find yeah. Batman versus Hulk on Marvel Unlimited. No, they don't put them on either service. Yeah, it's, and, it's same with the Malcolm books. Yeah. And then like I'm not I don't really want to pay $200 for Amazing Spider-Man versus Superman when I yeah. know this book is going to be 150 bucks and I can just read it. Get everything. I could, I could <laughs> easily yo-ho the um these books but i want to read it in print as intended yeah mm-hmm. yeah agreed and mm-hmm. what's cool is supposedly these books and hopefully this is part of the delay have a lot of back matter that's never been seen because all the amalgam books were printed in one set of trade paperbacks and that's it mm-hmm. and so and it had nothing in it so yeah. this will be the first time that they're a hardcover 
B, I'm assuming they're remastering them and taking good care of the quality. And C, they're putting additional back matter, apparently sketches and other stuff. So mm. I am so excited about this book. And I have no idea what it took legally to get them to finally do it. But it makes me very hopeful that while they were making that deal, they said they secretly <laughs> have Amalgam oh. Wave 2 coming in 2026 i'm curious wave three, because technically. wave yeah. three yeah, yeah that's true <laughs> well warner brothers does seem kind of loosey-goosey with some of their properties now like the fact that the new batman animated movie series is out on amazon rather than hbo they do seem very open to just maybe like getting those characters out there in exchange for money. So maybe I could see them much more likely making a deal than Marvel than lending Marvel, their characters. Yeah. But Marvel also probably has the infrastructure there. Though public or... Marvel publishing is often not as profit generating as they want it to be. Mm. And so this is a way to do that. I yeah, mean, totally. we've said, I think every time we've talked about Amalgam, we've said these companies are literally just leaving money on the table by not <laughs> revisiting this. Yeah. So, and they love events so much. I now just make this a, not every year necessarily, but every couple of years you could do a new Amalgam event and it just boosts both of their sales. To your point, it, everybody benefits. <laughs> or well, even if it's just, even if it's just a crossover that people have been clamoring for, like Batman Beyond meets Spider-Man 2099, it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be um, a big deal. It could just be, hey, here's this cool one shot that people have been wanting. Like, let's make yeah. it. Though I think there's enough of us now reaching the age, which includes the people in charge at Marvel and mm -hmm. DC. So that's what makes me hopeful, where I think if they do a crossover, most of us are going to be wanting it to be an amalgam. Like, yeah. like it's going to be hard for them. As as fun as it would be to see two characters pair up, it would definitely have to be on the road to amalgam. Like, whatever that crossover is, better get me toward two characters being fused together, because that's mm -hmm. what I'm here for. Right. <laughs> and, and then I back to the amalgam true. omnibus. Yeah. <sighs> Not to just keep bringing this bastard up again but um his particular books are not in there oh get out so it's not complete it's not complete and they should have just scrubbed his name off because one of them jlx was also co-written by M mark wade awesome dude love Mark. unless Wade. maybe in the delays that's been changed mm. maybe they are putting them so. in in a different <laughs> way or something yeah that would really be a shame if it was incomplete, yeah. especially since these are things that are so hard for people to get. I mm -hmm. mean, this will be so many people's only path to getting it unless yeah. they want to go dig in back issues. So, yeah, let's hope it's complete. But when it finally comes out, I think it'll be time for us to do another Amalgam <laughs> episode together. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> So for now, though, that is a wrap. Dear watchers, thank you for listening. Ethan, thank you for joining us as always. And Ethan, how can people find you? Because you are a world builder all to your own. <laughs> Big time, yes. You can primarily find me on Twitter at Make Mine Amalgam. Um, you can also find me on threads and Instagram, Make underscore mine underscore amalgam and blue sky on make mine amalgam dot blue sky or bsky dot however those that go <laughs> close enough <laughs> make mine amalgam on blue sky you'll find it um I try, i'm trying to post more on those other ones but i don't know twitter was like the og and that's the one that i just keep using <laughs> You have to move over because that means we're missing most of your posts. I know. Yeah, I know. I got like all the like all the good stuff is there. So I unless there's some crazy way that I could just like transfer it without it being manual. <laughs> <laughs> well, people should track you down because yeah, you you build characters, you create characters, and not just. Uh, character designs and profiles but the actual character 
being held in your hand. You yes, create them with Marvel figures. Legends, I take Marvel Legends characters and or Marvel Legends figures. I will reconfigure it, re- reconfigure them, and I um, will create stories with them and just make up different characters with different uh, backgrounds and whatnot. I have my primary speedster. Her name is Ace, the number one fastest woman alive. Nope. She gets with Sunfire. There she is. Because, uh, <laughs> well, I actually decided to pair, I wanted to pair them up because um, Sunfire is one of my favorite um, heroes who also happens to be Japanese. But Ace, a.k.a. Keiko Kishi, is also Japanese. Um, and yeah, she's got the name Ace because she's number one fastest uh, person alive. But also <laughs> Ace as a play on the fact that her character is canonically Arrow Ace. She is not um, cool in um, any of that. And actually one of the plot points is her arch rival um, Oni is... A uh, very dangerous simp, shall we say. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I love it. There's so many relationships and uh, identities that you're incorporating into your world, and it's so oh, fun yeah. to see. Oh, I haven't even gotten into the goof. Who's my main? Who's my main silly character? Very inspired <laughs> by um, your favorites. We know my favorite heckler. <laughs> but canonically, if anyone hasn't heard of Funny Man. Funny mm. Man is a public domain character who was also the failed follow-up to Superman by Jerry uh, Siegel and Joe Shuster. Oh, uh, and he's and a so Golden Age like comic he's character. A golden age, okay. He's a Golden Age goofy superhero. Oh, um, yeah. who's a who's kind of like a clown but a superhero. And so I decided, well, he's public domain. Judy is his niece. Oh, right. Oh, I cool. Didn't say, I didn't say. Uh, her real name. The goof's real name is Judy Punch. <laughs> <laughs> that works out well. And I love yeah, that. her her girlfriend uh, uh, is a character named Glam Goddess who has uh, light powers and also happens to be um, a trans woman. Ah. Yeah, it's so fun. So people should absolutely find you, and you should move beyond Twitter so that we <laughs> yes, can we can we can find all these storylines. Because I see bits and pieces here and there, but I just thought maybe you weren't posting as frequently, and now it turns out you are. You're just only doing it in one place. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so thank you again for joining us, Ethan. I have been Rob. And our reading list for this episode is in the show notes. Follow us at Dear Watchers. And leave us a five-star review wherever you listen to podcasts. We'll be back soon with another trip through the multiverse. In the meantime keep pondering the possibilities. <laughs> <laughs>